Hey everybody, Jason here. A couple of programming notes. Uh, this is an interview I did with Tristan Hall uh, of Hall and Nothing Productions. He is here to advertise 1565 St. Elmo's Pay. Uh, the project is launching on October 4th, Friday, which is the day that this episode launches. So go ahead and go over to Kickstarter and check that project out. Uh, if it is not live by the time you hear this episode, then just go ahead and give it a couple of hours. The launch date should be October 4th, so go ahead and enjoy that. So a couple of things. First of all, we did the episode right after Tristan moved, so the sound quality is fairly poor. <laughs> At least on his end, he's uh, recording on an open-air microphone on his laptop or tablet or something. So uh, I like to keep things at a little bit at a higher standard, so I uh, just wanted to give people a heads up that that is happening. So, you know, sorry about that. Uh, the second thing is the um, episode was going to be uh, top 10 card games for one to two players, a little player count. Uh, because of the madness, because of everything going on, Tristan is giving you his top 10 games with a low player count. <laughs> I forgot the word card. Uh, I gave my, you know, top card game. So the list that we talk about, the top 10 list that's coming, it's a little bit imbalanced, but, um, you know what? We are keeping everything. <laughs> uh, it sounds good enough. Um, we have a lot of good stuff for you. The episode's really long because we have some historical talk that is coming, uh, on the other side. So, uh, please go ahead and pick out whatever you enjoy. Really hope you enjoy the episode. Really hope it generates some feedback. For, so yeah, let me stop blabbing on onto the show. Welcome to Every Night is Game Night, where two busy dads get games to the table by any means necessary. Check us out, along with other great podcasts, at Dicetowernetwork.com. Every Night is Game Night, episode 158, top 10 games for a low player count, and 1565 St. Elmo's Pay with Tristan Hall. Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome to Every Night is Game Night, the podcast that helps you get your head in the game. I am your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining us. We interrupt our parade through the hotness of Gen Con and delivered Kickstarters. We have done a whole bunch of episodes just giving you piles and piles and piles and piles and piles and piles of games. Uh, but we are going to just step in there just for a little bit and bring you a little bit of a uh a little bit of a service over here. Uh, I got a very, very fun game here on Kickstarter, and I have a very interesting guest who's here to talk about his game as well as deliver what you want, which is a top 10 list of other games that you go, you can go ahead and play. Uh, but this is uh, the CEO and president of Hall or Nothing Productions. He is the full-time person that brings you fun games like Lifeform and Gloom and Killforth and the new release that is hitting Kickstarter very, very soon. It is not out right now, but it will be hitting very, very soon. 1565 St. Elmo's Pay. We're going to get into all that with Tristan Hall. Welcome to the show, Tristan. Hello there. Welcome. Welcome to... Welcome. <laughs> Oh man, I'm the one up up at seven o'clock. What are you doing over there? I need another coffee. <laughs> Actually, uh, you, you it's like when people say happy birthday to you and you say it back, like, oh yes, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> You may be lapsing into your uh, your duties as a host. You also host the Board Chitless podcast. Ah uh, yes, that's a good cover. Yes, yes. That's exactly what I'm <laughs> we are not on board shitless. We are on every night is game night. But I'm happy to have you on to talk about your latest project. Uh, so this it, it is 1565 Saint Elmo's Pay. We're going to be talking about in a second. Uh, but I guess you know first we you've been on a couple of times. But you know just in case we uh, people are not quite familiar with all the things that you do, maybe just give a little quick synopsis of who Tristan Hall is and what he is bringing to the to gamers' lives right now. Oh right, okay. Thank. Well, yeah, it's um, you, you kind of covered most of it already with what you said. I, I run a little um, publishing company in the UK called Hollow Nothing Productions, and we specialise in delivering thematic games. Yes. Um, and it was kind of a pipe dream side project for me for a while there, a couple of years back, and then we um, or was able to make the decision to go full time and and run the company full time now uh, about two years ago. So, basically, my whole life is geekiness and games, which is fantastic. <laughs> after, working, after working for other people in offices for 20 years, you know, I finally found um, a job that I'm absolutely, you know, ecstatic about pretty much every day of my life. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we just, we use Kickstarter as our primary source of, of funding for our games. So, 
this the one that you mentioned that we're, we're coming up with soon 1565 St. Elmo's Pay is going to be our sixth Kickstarter, um, and we're dead excited about it. it. It sort of continues the tradition of um, historical card games that we're, we want to create, um, following on from my second game, which was 1066 Tears to Many Mothers, where basically I wanted to create a non-collectible Magic the Gathering where every card is based on a real person from history and sort of shine a light on some of the epic battles um, of legend kind of thing so yeah that's uh i've yeah. probably gone on myself a little bit too much there but that's kind of what i do uh, but yeah Hollow Nothing Productions. All right, so the we are going to do this episode in three parts. The first part, we're going to talk a little bit about St. Elmo's Pay. Uh, as we said, it is a follow-up to 1066 Tears to Many Mothers, which we did review on the podcast a little while ago, uh, kind of card dueling, you know, a, a game with historical features. Uh, and then we're going to get into the top 10 list. How I'm fashioning the top 10 list when it comes to a designer, as you heard with Adam and Brady Sadler, was... Let's do a top 10 list that kind of reflects on the project, uh, so, you know, your influences, you know, why, how um, some of the games that helped you design and, you know, give you ideas so that you can kind of bring forth this new thing. Uh, and, you know, who, lo- who doesn't love a top 10 list? You know, that's going to be great. Uh, and then, so that would be kind of the gaming content. Um, and then at the end, and we'll definitely invite people to whether listen or not listen <laughs> when it comes to that, because we're going to get into some of the historical background and... Uh, you know, this game is soaked in its history, and so was 1066, so we'll probably get into a little bit of that as well. Uh, and I'm I'm an amateur historian. Tristan over there is an amateur historian as well. <laughs> Absolutely, definitely. We have referred, that's how we refer to ourselves. We're going <laughs> to, whenever you Don't get... Don't to have any further qualifications with amateur. Exactly. <laughs> we love this stuff. Uh, we're always watching, uh, you know... Uh, Vikings. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh yeah, we're always watching like historical shows, and we're always watching, you know, uh, you know reading stuff and everything. So we're going to geek out about that a little bit. So uh, all right, so uh, let us get to Saint Elmo's Pay. So um, it is a card dueling game. Um, I guess I'll just start with 1066. So because uh, that gives context to what Saint Elmo's Pay is. So 1066. Um, I always like to say when people ask that. If the Battle of the Bastards from Game of Thrones was in a card game, that would be it. Nice. I like that analogy. Because <laughs> uh, if so, not a lot of Game of Thrones fans out there. But if you are a Game of Thrones fan, you kind of know exactly what I'm talking about. So you can do war in many different ways. You could do you know big skirmish battles. You could do kind of you know a multi theater events. Or, you know, there's a lot of ways you can kind of crack that nut. Uh, what what Trista's game is doing is. Uh, especially 1066, I've not played the new game, um, but you have two sides and they have decided to just throw the gauntlet down and this is it, you know. We're going to fight over a certain battle and, and the it's depicted by these kind of wedge cards and then your decks are basically just meat that you're just going to throw cards into a, a three by three grid, nine cards, and, and, it's, and your cards are going to die. <laughs> you're going to have awesome cards and they're going to die. And they're just going to like throw cards, throw cards, throw cards. And whoever can do that most tactically, whoever can combo most things along the way are going to win. So it's a very kind of claustrophobic, suffocating experience, but in a good way because it's evocative of the kind of pitched battle fight for every single inch that you can get kind of war that, you know, that was, you know, a, a feature of war when it came to like, you know, big throwdown battles. So um, I'm, I'm guessing, I mean, because I, I remember we talked about it at the time and that's like, like that was kind of the, what you were going for, like kind of, that kind of claustrophobic closed in feel. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, you, you nailed the description there beautifully. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't want to yeah, make I mean, you do too much work, my friend. You just moved. <laughs> I just turn up. I just, I just nod and agree with what you say. It's a, um, but yeah, no, 1565 absolutely follows on uh, from 1066 to uh, such an extent that it's actually compatible. It's backwards compatible with uh, 1066, Tears to Many Mothers. So the uh, the game mechanics are fundamentally the same, um, but the, it's designed to be as quickly access, as accessible as possible. So like with 1066, you grab your deck, you shuffle it, and off you go. There's no... Uh, deck building, there's no deck construction, so there's no sort of barrier to entry in terms of getting up and running. Um, and it plays again, you know, 30 to 40 minutes, um, you can sort of rattle through it on your lunch break kind of thing. But what I also try to uh, build into the very first sort of experience of playing it 
is, as you mentioned there, the history. Um, so each of the cards in the game is based on a real person or a real event, and there's some painstakingly researched uh, flavor text on every single card in the game explaining who that person was or you know why that particular battle took place or what that objective represents kind of thing. And so it's, it's a great opportunity for me to sort of bury my head back in the history books with a highlighter pen and go through and, and research battles that are of interest, you know, that I might have known a little bit about, but then want to sort of drill down deeper and, and find out who, who were the principal protagonists, who, you know, who's the story about, and, and, and try and sort of siphon those narrative moments from the battles and find a way to insert them into the card game. Um, and, and as soon as you start doing that, or as soon as I start doing that, it, it triggers ideas of like how that card or that person or that event might be represented mechanically in the game. So, for example, in the Siege of Malta, there are lots of artillery. So we've got new card types in this game. There's artillery cards that will shoot and fire through every single card in, in a column kind of thing. Um, and, and just those sort of little notions of, of how the battles changed from you know, 1066 over to 1565 and the new units and the new characters and stuff um, really helps and, and dovetails nicely with, with the mechanics of the game. Because it's not a massively complex game, you know, and you, you can just sort of dive straight into it. And so I've tried not to change too much of the fundamental mechanics, but each card in the game gives you a way of breaking that system and, and adding its own new thing. Um, the Battle of Hastings in 1066 was fought over three sort of wedges of troops. Um, and as it happens, the Siege of Malta was fought over three frontiers as well, three fortresses. So we've been able to even keep that sort of set up. Um, but those fortresses varied in, in value and in strength. So each of those has a different value in this game. You know, well, the St. Elmo's, the doomed fortress on the top of Mount Sibras, uh, historically went first. So that has like a lower strength in the game than, for example, uh, Burgu and Senglia, which are the other two frontiers that it was fought over. So it's just been a, a sort of, a fantastic opportunity for me to geek out over history <laughs> and, and, um, and follow a system that you know it it, it caught people's imaginations we've you know we sold out of 1066 so this this game is going to dovetail with the second print run of um mm. many months and okay so you can get both games as a package during this kickstarter that's the plan yeah originally i wasn't going to offer that but then when the when 1066 sold out and we the requests started sort of stacking up for it and realized that it's just a, another way to sort of draw attention to the campaign and, and hopefully draw people in. So, sure. um, and since they are the same system, then yeah, it makes no sense not to, I suppose. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, and, and it's the second game design that I did after Gloomy Killforth and, and it's been great to sort of return to that uh, game design and try and breathe new life into it, you know, and, and find new ways to, um, approach it and also take on the feedback from players who played 1066 and the things that they wanted to see in it and um, you know have, have that input from the players as well um, so yeah it's been it's it's one that I'm really excited about and also we're at a stage now as a company where we've been gathering the artwork beforehand so one of our big things is we have an insane amount of art in our games and it takes lots of time oh for my art. God. <laughs> That. So <laughs> I remember, uh, uh, Tristan, you wrote an article, uh, either the blog post or a Twitter post or something about how with Gloom and Killforth, you did all these unique art assets and you're like, never again. And then <laughs> here you are. <laughs> you can't help yourself, man. Someone, someone get this man an intervention. <laughs> please, please, <laughs> please do that. <laughs> <laughs> the art is crazy in your in your games, like you know, re like realistic, but not cheesy. Pic, you know, like a photo reel or whatever it is. Just, yeah. You you play a Hall of Nothing game, any Hall of Nothing game, especially your card games. I mean, you are going to be in for a, a a delight for your senses, and <laughs> I can only see the the harried, exhausted person who has to put all that together behind it. <laughs> well, luckily we've got a whole team now internationally, so we kind of share share the load. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's for me, it's super important for the games to look as good as they can. I want them to be able to sit alongside like Star Wars titles and Lord of the Rings titles and mm. and hold their own. And for me, as a gamer, that's one of the things that will will turn me on or off a game. You know, I will pick up a box and buy a game in a shop based on how gorgeous the artwork is. I'm I'm, I'm an art whore in that respect. Mm. 
And similarly, it will put me off. Uh, there, are, there are great games that it's taken me a long time to come round to, um, because one reason or another I wasn't a fan of the art or the graphic design, you know, the, the style kind of thing. So it's something I'm super conscious of, that as we've, we've set our stall, we have to have brilliant artists. And I think for something like this as well, where you're trying to shine a light on um, a dark historical period, um, I think it's really important to try and capture a sense of that and give the players a sense of, like, delving into a bit of what it might have been like, you know, and, and who these people were. And, um, I mean, obviously, there were no iPhones around 500 years ago, so uh, most of it is conjecture, but we do have, we send our artists um, books with, the, like, the, the armour and the clothing of the time so that they got, like, reference material to try and dress the characters appropriately and stuff. And we, whilst we allow for a certain amount of artistic um, license, mm -hmm. we their games to be as realistic as possible, you know, so make sure that they have the right sort of helmets and guns. And All right, so let us get to our top 10 list. Uh, we are going to shout out uh, our friends over at Low Player Count, Donnie and Travis, who don't post a lot of episodes anymore, but we're hopeful. Uh, we love them, and we are hopeful to carry forward the spirit of Low Player Count here at Every Night is Game Night as we go through some content that is specific uh, for the people who love those Low Player Count games. We have a top 10 list uh, since uh, St. Elmo's Pay and Tis Many Mothers are both uh, games for one to two players. Uh, we have 10 more games for one to two players that may or may not have influenced the design of St. Elmo's Pay. Top 10 lists are fun. I have top uh, uh, 10 games as well for low player count. I love cards, so I kind of specialize in cards. But Tristan's like, you know what? I'm going to do whatever I want. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> top 10 low player count games uh for one to two players so we are going to start with number 10. uh how does how do they say that in the dice tower number 10. something like that. <laughs> nice okay so um i i'm gonna say this is number 10 but i didn't put them in specific order to allow myself the flexibility to change the order <laughs> um, okay. but i'm gonna i'm gonna open with um size in the number 10 spot size uh, yeah it's um so obviously not a card game but in terms of uh, like an inspiration, it is a game that I think is beautifully designed, but also beautifully presented. And the world building of the artists is present throughout the game. The sort of the mesh of the Euro mechanics in, in the wood with the with the like thematic mechanics in plastic, um, the the actual player boards. Everything about it is so beautifully presented. For me, it's like a hallmark of like how a game should feel and how a game should look. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's got that great sort of alternate sort of steampunk World War One vibe, which is just, uh, I think it's the first game to really do it justice in the way that it has. Mm -hmm. uh, you, do you prefer like a, a two-player intimate game or do you prefer just kind of sitting there with the Automa and duking it out? Yeah, so in terms of low player counts, I think it is great as a, as a two-player versus game, but now, even if I did play it two players, we would tend to put the Otomas in as well. Right. Uh, and as a solo game, yeah, I've absolutely spammed the heck out of it. <laughs> <laughs> to, to the point where, uh, when we did, last time we played a multiplayer game, um, they kind of ganged up on me because they're like, well, you've played against the Otoma you know, too many times now, so you've, you've got too much experience. So they sort of went after me. <laughs> this is fair, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the, the the solo rules t take a while to sort of process. There's like an eight page booklet that comes with it. But uh, I think it's more than Munrad Peterson and his team, the Automa Factory, who've who put those rules together. And it's just brilliant. It takes away once you have processed it, it takes away all the sort of bother of having to run a second player. Um, you know, you you just you get the effects of what that player would have done rather than having to think about what that, that AI player's turn should have been. Right. Uh, and that was definitely a factor in the design for the solo play for, for 1066, um, which is the same for 1565 as well, to, to create an AI that runs smoothly enough that it gives you a sense of what it'd be like to play against another player without the sort of real estate or upkeep of you having to imagine what it you know, what that player should be doing. You know, like playing chess by yourself and trying to sort of think of the best move for it. You don't have to have that. You don't have that sort of mental real estate. You just play the game, you flip a card, and the AI does its thing. And um, so, yeah, that's something we've, we've borrowed heavily for, from 
for uh, the solo design for 1066 and 1565. Uh, my number 10 game, not going to go on about it too much because it is a placeholder for another game. Uh, uh, my number 10 game is Arkham Horror LCG. Uh, I do not own Arkham Horror LCG. I've not played a whole bunch of Ar Arkham Horror LCG. I don't have a lot of people in my ambit who have it. Um, but I love it. <laughs> I want to play more of it, but it's Arkham. So I'm not going to play too much more of it because it's Arkham. And I'm not a big Arkham fan. But I am looking forward to Marvel Champions LCG, which is the next LCG that is coming. Oh, my God. If that is anything close to what I hope it is, <laughs> that may be the thing that takes all my money. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's already on pre-order <laughs> for me. And, yeah. and the most exciting thing about that is being able to play it with my little one, my nine-year-old, because he's a massive Marvel yes. Cinematic Universe fan. So I cannot wait for you know him to be uh, Black Panther uh, or Captain America is his favorite, mm -hmm. and be Spider-Man alongside him. Absolutely. You know? but, yeah, yeah I, no. I can't wait for it. I hope it's good. So placeholder <laughs> 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 on my list. All right, so let's get to number nine. Okay, so for me, um, it was a tough choice between Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game, or the Predator deck building game. Really? And wow. Went with, you, I, I went with... That's <laughs> the first time I've heard that. Like, are people usually think that Predator is kind of a notch below Alien. Well, it's interesting you say that. I, I prefer the theme of Alien, and um, for the low play count, the solo and co-op modes, Alien gives you four scenarios because it's got four movies. Um, and then that's expanded out expansions. They've got like the hard versions of each movie. Um, but the Predator deck building game has the better system. The mechanics are just more polished. They're sort of, there's um, brothers in arms and call for backup kind of things where it makes it more cooperative. And it just, it feels more polished as an experience um, without sort of compromising on the difficulty. And it's so much so in fact that they made, they transferred the sort of com composition of the decks from Predator back into Alien to make it a bit more balanced. But mm. to be fair, nothing gives you the same experience as running around, you know, the Solarco or LV-426. <laughs> you just can't get that Predator. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was Legendary Encounters. Uh, pick your pick your version. <laughs> They're all pretty good. I, I, I actually like the encounter system a little bit better than the regular Legendary. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so my number nine is actually a brand new hotness. I'm succumbing to the brand new hotness. We haven't even reviewed this game yet on Every Night's Game Night. Looking forward to it. Have, I need to get more plays first. Uh, but it is Edge of Darkness. Uh, speaking oh. speaking of Kickstarter, <laughs> did, did you see this one on Kickstarter when it was on? I saw it at Gen Con and I felt the weight of the box. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> It's huge. They, they can't even sell it at retail. I think it's going to be one of them Kickstarter only things. It may be on as we're posting episode uh, already on Kickstarter, or at least it's going to be soon for an expansion for it. I love it. It is so good. And I'm not like I did not like Mystic Veil. It felt like more like a pile of mechanisms rather than yeah. a real game. So it's a card crafting system. If, you, if people don't know, you have a, a cellophane um, sleeve with one little power and then as you go you can buy these cards plastic cards that, that fit in the sleeve and you kind of buff the original card so it solves the problem that a lot of deck builders have where the base cards are just kind of cruddy and then you either have to call them or you're stuck with them or whatever it's just kind of a management thing that you know you don't at the end game you don't want to pot you won't have to manage that stuff um with with edge of darkness you're building those cards kind of more synthetically uh, Mystic Veil just had that, so I didn't wasn't impressed by it. Ed, Edge of Darkness adds a whole bunch of other stuff. You're fighting uh, monsters. You're uh, you kind of have this central row of things that you're crafting. Like you kind of um, you can craft you can draft other people's cards out of the central row, which is kind of one of the things about it at a cost. They add so much stuff to it that it had this had to be the original game. And then, and then they said, okay, let's just while we make this big monstrosity. Let's just release Mystic Veil. <laughs> it maybe I think that is close to the story that happened. Like, okay, that the original game was Edge of Darkness. I really right. like it. This, there's a solo mode to it, and it's very easy to run and easy to play. I cannot wait to play more of this. I, I'm maybe a little bit premature to put this on a top ten list of low player count games, but man, I really, really dig it. I look forward to giving it a try. <laughs> All right, so uh, let us get to number eight. Low player count games. Okay, for number eight, I've got uh, Labyrinth, The War on Terror. 
Whoa! <laughs> okay, well, not whoa. We're, we're talking about war games over here, so. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's um, it's probably one of the densest games systems to sort of process. Um, it's well, war gamers, to be fair, would argue against that. But I think from you know, for someone who just picks up a game off the shelf and wants to give a, a two-player game a go, it is it's very complex. And learning the solo rules for it is as complex again. It's like the it's like learning the game all over again, and you've got to follow bots sort of flow charts to make everything work. Um, which is complex, and every time I every time I play it, it feels like starting again. <laughs> right. But once you get through that, it provides a really unique experience and a real sort of nail biting um, battle for you know for the fate of of modern day Middle East, basically. And it's uh, it's again really heavily researched. The guy who designed it, Volko Runko, I think he worked for the CIA, um, and it just it, it really delivers, and it's really steeped in the history. Every card in the game, again, is based on a real event, and the way that they trigger each round will either provide you like a, a, a benefit, but with something negative happening to you at the same time, or you can use it for a lesser um, value, but without the, the negative effect. Um, and it's just, it always has this sort of crucial... Um, what do you call it? It's like a dynamic where you got to choose, you know, between one horrible thing happening to you or a different kind of horrible thing happening to you, and, uh, like and a just Sophie's to... choice or something. Say again, sorry. Like a Sophie's choice. Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not to get too dark, but <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's a pretty bleak theme, to be fair. But yeah, and, and that sort of escalates as the game goes on. So it's. Yeah, brilliantly designed. Uh, very not not easy to access. Not as easy to pick up as like a deck builder, but um, fantastic and looks great on the table. GMT do a brilliant job on the sort of production values as well. All right, I've never played it. I'm intimidated by GMT. I need someone to kind of guide me along, hold my hand. <laughs> yeah, I wish I'd had someone to do that for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> but you fought through, and you, uh, you you were rewarded for your experience. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. So I'm going to get to a much simpler game, <laughs> getting my, get my realm a little bit. Uh, Hero Realms. So Hero Realms, I chose it over Star Realms. I actually like the Star Realms kind of balance of attacking and defending. The, the numbers seem a little bit more kind of in line, where Hero Realms is more like the, the, the attack numbers are huge. So like <laughs> you put something out, it's like bam, 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 bam. It's, it's, just, it's much more of a rock'em, sock'em thing. Um, so it's like, I, I go back and forth with that, but... The theme is better. Obviously, I'm a big fantasy guy, not as much of a sci-fi guy. And uh, co-op mode, story mode, there's more campaign coming uh, from a delivered Kickstarter that's happening later in the year. Uh, it's just a, if I just want a very quick, uh, I can't play Gloom of Killforth, Tristan. It's too long. <laughs> <laughs> I can't just like, I want an adventure game uh, quickly for an evening. I'm going to lay out a Gloom of Killforth. Oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? When you don't want to do that, um, I, I recommend that, by the way. <laughs> Play Gloom Kid, it's really good. But when you don't want to do all that, you just want a smaller experience that give, delivers 85% of what that is, Hero Realms is definitely your bet. Agreed. It's a great game, and I prefer the fantasy theme. Um, although we did battle through the entire campaign, I think, in one sitting. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not the worst thing in the world. <laughs> it's not the worst thing, but it, it, it made it made us less inclined to go back to it. Because it's like, okay, we've, we've done that now. <laughs> Absolutely, you're right. All right, so this now we're on to number seven. What is your number seven low player count game, Tristan? I have the seven continent. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> There's like people who put seven wonders as their number seven on like every other list. <laughs> I don't know. It probably should be higher up the list. Like I said, I, I wasn't massively thinking about the order here, but um, in terms of like uniqueness and just the ambition of it. I think it definitely deserves a spot in the, in the top ten. And the design, the layout of the map is gorgeous as it unfolds. I love the fact that you have to sort of, they provide a magnifying glass with the game so you can look at the cards to see if you can see any secret paths printed on the, the island as you go. Um, mechanically, I'm not as big a fan of it. It's like your, your, your life is your deck, but the deck isn't, isn't as snappy and as interesting as, as like deck building games and stuff but right. the, the fact that you've got just like a hundred hours of island to explore and I think I'm, I don't think I ever got further than 20 hours in but it's one of those ones that I want to go back to you know I want to pick it back up 
and, and get properly stuck into it. And there's, there was just nothing else like it. And I don't think there has been since. So, yeah, a beautifully ambitious game um, and a, a paying to, like, sort of fighting fantasy game books, which I was a massive fan of as a, as a kid as well. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I got stuck at the beginning with that big first mission and had never gone back. I, it sounds like they made a lot of improvements with the second printing and, you know, different scenarios and everything. So, I you know, I don't have a lot of people in my life that have it. I don't have it. Um, but it's one of those of, like, it's gone from I had my opinion, but now it's kind of incomplete because there's a bunch of different things that have happened with the design since then. So yeah. looking forward to maybe. <laughs> I always put out a call to listeners, <laughs> anybody that just wants to grab me at a convention or at a local place and, hey, you have to check this out again. I, someone actually did that. Game. <laughs> and they tried that with Xeno Shift with me because I don't, I did not like Xeno Shift um, at all. And I had like someone I posted on the geek list, and I had had my opinion, and they're like, "Oh, I noticed you didn't like Xeno Shift. I'm going to show you like all the improvements that were made." Blah blah blah. And we did it, and I still don't like it, but <laughs> but they tried. <laughs> and it was fun. I played on the app. It seemed it seemed quite it seemed good on the app, but I didn't stick with it. So right. um, something must have put me off. <laughs> right. All right, uh, so that was number seven, the seventh continent. Uh, my number seven. I, I, this seems to be a trend here, Tristan. I got you give some like big honking game, and I got some little tiny. <laughs> <laughs> what does it say about me? <laughs> well, this is why you're not ready to set up blue and kill for all the time. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I don't have the capacity. <laughs> uh, so I have the Castles of Burgundy card game. So if people know anything about me, I'm a thematic gamer. What is Castles of Burgundy doing on my list? I still like a good strategic nut to crack every once in a while. That's manageable. Uh, and obviously, obviously Castle of Burgundy is a the board game. And, it, you know, it's good. I like it. But I love the fact that the card game boils, like, a really huge percentage of that game down. And it fits in a magic card box. Like, I could just I walk around with it. I can just lay it out, play a solo game. It's very, the solo bot is very clever. Because it's it's so simple, it's just like score thre- scoring thresholds, but it's still kind of a jerk because it could cheat and <laughs> has a little bit of personality to it. Um, obviously, the multiplayer game is you know satisfying too. I'm still playing it. Like this has been what three four years now. Um, I'm still playing Castleberg card game. Little satisfying little solo. I really like it. Nice. I'm gonna add it to my wish list. <laughs> there you go. No, no. Are you? Because you, I know you're a thematic gamer, and I know. Hall of Nothing specialized in thematic games. How much do you get into those, like, just pure Euros and pure, like, you know, just strategy type things? Um, when I saw, I mean, go back about 10, 15 years, on Board Game Geek, Agricola was hovering, hovering at the number one spot just forever. So I was like, all of my games were about goblins and monsters and whatever else. And I thought, I'm going to have to pick up a Euro and just, you know, see what it's all about. And so I picked up the <laughs> medieval farming game. And got absolutely hooked, and I loved it. I loved the cleanness of the mechanics. Nice. Uh, I loved the fairness of it, and it was playing those Euro games. And I did go on to collect a lot more as well. My, my wife and I played Viticulture; it's probably our favourite game to sit and play together mm-hmm. uh, over a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> and, the game really in, just invites it. It's like, okay, just just go get does, wine yeah. while you play this. But the the fairness and the quickness um, of the turns, you know, you um, with the Euro, it's like I take a turn, you take a turn, I take a turn, and that's something that hugely influenced me for for Gloomy Killforth. You know, it's an action point game. You, you, I take an action, you take an action, and I loved that. Just sort of scooting around the table, everybody just gets a quick go, but it gives you a bigger sense of what's happening and, and building a story with it. So, uh, yeah, I pinched liberally from Euro games over time, um, and I think I mean the perfect game sits between. The elegance of a euro and the theme of you know uh, a thematic game yeah i find that you know there's a lot of trade-offs there right so you know when you you say i want to streamline thing and i want to streamline thing you could streamline the thing right you could streamline the theme right out of a game correct yeah you can pare it down almost completely and 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 some euros do that and and we have played somewhere i'm just like this doesn't have to be about you know uh, trading horses. This could literally be anything, and you wouldn't feel any different. And I think once you've got to that point, you have gone too far. Um, right. So, yeah, I, I think uh, there's a middle ground, definitely, for for keeping the theme, keeping a the thematic narrative adventure, um, but also having a clean, fair, or at least a, a fair feeling mechanic that gives everybody uh, an even chance. All right. So I ambushed the uh, top ten list a little bit with a little sidebar. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> 
How dare we talk about games? <laughs> How dare we talk about games in a gaming list? <laughs> <laughs> Let us get back to the business at hand. Number six. Okay, I've gone for Spirit Island. Ooh, there we go. So this is one of the games I know we were talking before the uh, podcast about uh, art and stuff. And um, I think the art put me off this for quite a while. It put mm. me off uh, because it, it seemed like it was sort of a, a throwaway family game, you know, um, sort of in the style of, uh, well, like Candyland or something like that. And, and I just, the colours were garish, the, the map board isn't great. In fact, I would go so far as to say it's, it's not nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, it, it looks like a sort of four different palettes from like, paint you know uh, from the program paint and, and it's just visually i find it very unappealing but the gameplay is brilliant it's fantastic and it's a unique theme you're you're playing as the spirits of an island defending it from uh, oncoming conquistadors um, and the card play in it is fantastic you can play fast cards and slow cards and each of them has a different sort of tactical effect um, and it builds you to builds you throughout the game through sort of agonizing resource-based decisions to like preparing for massive moves where you can wipe out tons of bad guys across the map and that feeling of empowerment once it kicks in once you pulled off a great move and destroyed a couple of cities um is brilliant it's a it's a really great cooperative experience do you play uh when you play solo do you play with one spirit or two uh, well, I've only played solo a couple of times so far, um, and each time I've only played with one because that's enough for me to try to wrap my head around. <laughs> but it does, unfortunately, it does make it means you only get one piece of island, which is a very small board. When you've got like the full board, um, is you know makes it look like a proper game. Whereas when you've just got like one piece of island, it looks like this tiny part of a game. Um, and I've read reports from people who say you have to play multiple spirits so that you can combo across them and. Uh, and all that stuff, but and I, I, I just with solo games, I just like to play with one character, or, you know, one sort of unit sort of thing. It, it's funny you mention that because we're having a conversation uh, over on the One Stop Co-op Shop Slack. Thank you for giving me that in to advertise a <laughs> little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, so we do have a Slack channel. I don't know if you know uh, use Slack in your personal uh, business tech transactions or anything. No. <laughs> nope, no Slack for you. Uh, no, no Slack in. No slacking. <laughs> Too busy. Actually, it's funny that it's called Slack because there's a lot of notifications that come in and it like really decreases your productivity. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we had a uh, so there's a lot of people, a lot of co-op fans, solo fans, and we're talking about like what solo gamers prefer. Do we do you prefer like do, does a publisher need to say that my game is solo and you're only playing one character? Do I have to specify that, or can I say? This is a co-op game. You can play it solo, one, two, three characters, or whatever. Or just like leave it there. Or it, it, like, there's something really valuable about like you know communicating to the consumer that this is a one character experience. You know. Yeah, it's um, as a player, I definitely value that pure solo play because the amount of games that are like oh, fully soloable, and you put, you get it, and it's like just play as four characters. And it just, it, <laughs> It doesn't feel like it's catering for you at all. It just feels like, right. uh, yeah, you could do that, I suppose, if you wanted to. That's how you do it. You know, it's like an afterthought. Um, and even, like, ones where it goes, oh, you only have to play as two characters. For me, that's still, you're not sort of um, getting into the spirit of the game if you're not representing a person kind of thing. I always prefer to play as, as one hero in those kinds of games if, if possible. But almost invariably, like, the dudes on a map type games very rarely go below uh, two heroes um yeah. i did try playing a shadows of brimstone adventure with one cowboy and you know he's got murdered <laughs> uh, so for me i think it's important to at least try to find a way to offer that um and then of course you will get the kickback from solo players who love playing as multiple characters yes. and in fact love finding combos across oh if i play as four guys i can do this this and this and you know i can build my whole D, &D party kind of thing um so i think you know having the option to to offer uh, play as one character or one spirit or whatever, I think for me that's important. But I can see why um, publishers are just would just get to the point of saying, "Look, you can totally play it solo because you just use four dudes or whatever." Um, and and in effect, that's that's true. So <laughs> yeah, but it's easier. I mean, like, risk of not committing either way. <laughs> the difference between playing one and playing two is so huge. It's it's, yeah. it's so much bigger the difference between two and three. 
because with two, there's a multiplier effect where you can get those combos going and it kind of gets the balance balance in. Or even yeah. like a, something silly like a, a deck builder. I'm, I'm, I have a, a, a tableau deck builder thing later, later in the list. And when you're playing two characters, you can kind of get that market moving and like things move and things happen. And yeah. I can bounce things off each other. When I'm playing with one, everything stops <laughs> <laughs> in, in certain designs. And you have to account for that in the design and put extra time into your game to enable the one character experience. So if you're not, if your game is not built from the ground up for one, then it's actually surprisingly difficult, I would, I would think. Yeah. Well, it can be, especially, well, you've got to decide, haven't you, from the outset, are you building it for a one-player experience or are you building it as a multiplayer experience or are you going to, from the outset, from the very first design, try and scale it so that all of those experiences are catered for? Um, I know from our point of view, as a huge like fan of solo games, I've tried to make sure all of our games have a solo play option um, and how that's catered for Will, will vary depending on the type of game that it is. So in Gloomy Killforth, you set up, there's no change. It's exactly the same game. Uh, you just have one dude. You can play as multiple characters if you want, um, but it will completely not change the game at all if you play as one character. Whereas in something like 1066 Tears to Many Mothers or 1565 Elmer's Pay, we have to develop a, you know, a, a small booklet of solo rules. It's only like four pages, but it allows the bot player, the AI player, to give you that sense of, uh, a thinking, breathing opponent. Um, and then the the only other option that I can think of is one that we did for Lifeform, which is it wasn't designed for solo play at all. It was a two to four player game. But I had a long conversation with Mark Chaplin, the designer, and convinced him that we should build a solo expansion so that people can play it um, as one hero running around you know, this giant spaceship. And so he spent months pouring his creative energy into developing a, a bespoke solo expansion which takes the base game and and like expands it to create this uh, personalized solo player experience so we've literally run the gamut of all the ways that you can offer <laughs> solo play in the game all right so the next game that i have my number six on the list is actually my only game on my top 10 that does not solo and i don't want it to solo um, and it actually, it's the game that is closest to uh, St. Elmo and Taste of Many Mothers. Uh, the old Reiner Knizia game, Battle Line. Uh, I think that I, this is called, what, Schottentotten? Something like that? I don't know if, you're, uh, if you know anything about that. I only heard of Battle Lines and that somebody once, an early playtest of 1066 said, oh, this is like Battle Lines, but I've never actually played it. Really? I, I'm, I'm shocked by that because this, there's a lot that's similar. Really? Really, yeah, it, I mean, it's a, it's a Knizia game, so it's you know it's really super distilled and simple and everything, but it's it's a line, and you have to control like in, in Tears to Many Mothers, you have to control two of three wedges. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I imagine same almost pays the same. We're like, okay, if you get two of the three areas, then that's what that's how you win. That's how you win. Yeah. So there's more. I think there's like ten spots here, but you have to get a majority of okay. these spots, and your troops. Are basically like poker hands so you know you're building your your troops in your line and you're trying to build like you know i uh a three card hand or a four card hand and then you know this hand has a straight and this hand has a flush a flush beach a straight they call it something different they call it you know formations but come on <laughs> 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 we see you Ryan you, you got you put <laughs> random words in there you didn't mean those uh, but that's what you're doing. So you, and you're playing cards one at a time, and there's special cards that kind of make things wild. And you, you, you. Once you're playing into a certain thing, you're looking at the board, going, "Okay, they have. They're building up this flush over there. Is that a feint? Is that not a feint? Uh, I think they're building a flush. So I'm going to build over here. And it really is this kind of this looking at, okay, which areas can I conquer? And it gets me to see. It gets me in that very similar strategic headspace. As Tears Many Mothers did, I'm actually I'm very very surprised. Go play that game right now. <laughs> Go <laughs> okay. play Battle Line right now. I love I re if I'm gonna play a two player game and two player only game, that's probably gonna be the one. It really is. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to add that to my wish list as well. <laughs> I'm making a running list now. You've made two games in that same system. It, this is beyond <laughs> wish list stuff, my friend. <laughs> The world we're in now. You, you think you come up with a unique idea, and already <laughs> thousands of people have already done it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was the only two-player only game on the list. Everything else is solo and, and, and two-player. Uh, so that's Battle Line. 
All right, we've gotten to the top five. We're only like an hour into the list. <laughs> 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 I really hope that people are vibing with what we're doing over here. Anyway, so number five, uh, hit me with some. Uh, the t- uh, actually, you because you because you're just kind of like messing around with the list. So this is not your top five. Uh, once you play our games, he's just like the the last of the list, right? <laughs> last five. Last <laughs> Although you know, I do rate them all very highly, and I think a, a few of these top five would be my actual top five. Absolutely. So, let, I mean, let's just say it counts for today. <laughs> cool. All right, number five. Okay, so, I had to have a dudes on a map game because I've got so many of them, um, and I was trying to pare it down from all of the ones on my shelf, and I came to Fire Team Zero. Mm, wow. Yeah. Okay. So the theme for me is an absolute win. You know, uh, weird war two, a bunch of elite special forces behind enemy lines fighting the enemy, and in this case, the enemy happens to be mutant monster, undead, alien, grizzly demon things. Um, and the miniatures are great. The maps are brilliant, but the gameplay is fantastic. You each have like a, a bespoke deck of cards depending on the character type, whether you have a sniper or a demolitions expert. Um, and you're running around the map, you can't you can't just clear a room, the enemies just keep coming at you. So it's about managing these waves and waves of bad guys whilst trying to achieve the objectives of the of whichever map it is. And the objectives are really sort of thematic events that happen throughout the course of the game. Um, and it just speaks to me on a fundamental dice rolling, monster bashing level, um, with great theme and great art. Mm-hmm. Is that a, that's a co op, right? It is, yeah. Uh, and it's one where if you wanted to play it solo, you'd have to play as two guys. <laughs> you forgive it. <laughs> yeah, I forgive it. Yeah, the only other sort of the second place contender was going to be um, one of the like Zombie Side Black Plague or Zombie Side Invaders, just because that's the one I play so much with my son. My uh, yeah. little one loves these ones because they capture his imagination so much. Um, and mm-hmm. Zombie Side just has like the path of least resistance in terms of like simplicity, simple to play. Elegant sort of design. I mean, I say elegant. It, it gets quite clunky once the zombies st- stop. Yes, that. yes, it is not uh, elegant. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> less options. I was thinking about when we were talking about Matt Leacock before, you know, and you can only do three or four things at each turn, and it's the same in Zombie Side. But no, I think Fire Team Zero just achieves the same objectives, but does them uh, with much greater depth of gameplay and story. And a lot of flair. Uh, that is, I'm glad you mentioned that one. I've been meaning to track that one down. I uh, don't know if that's an active product right now, but we'll see. All right. Uh, so my game, uh, my number five game, I was my favorite game last year. Uh, it is a game that I play to relax. Uh, there's, a, I think there is a game that's coming in here that is going to uh, knock that off in terms of a relaxation game, but we'll see. Um, but it is Sunset Over Water. So instead of a water is from Pencilverse Games, uh, Dr. Steve Finn, Keith Matika on the solo. You are collecting beautiful paintings, so you're not destroying alien mutants. You're doing <laughs> the opposite of... <laughs> you're, you're, it's easier to destroy than it is to create. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, the least resistance over here. Uh, so... Yes, yeah, so, so you're just a little meeple guy, and you're running. You uh, walk around, and the solo mode is very, very clever. It's it's it reimagines the game. Speaking of like different um, approaches to solo, some solo kind of just plops on top of the game. This is one of the solo modes that reimagines what you have to do, uh, but keeps the kind of the soul of the game together. I thought it was great. It's very relaxing. I still play it. Uh, so that's Sunset Over Water. All right, so number four. We are getting to the cream of the cream over here. What is your number four? Okay, um, we are getting to the cream of the cream. This is one of my favorite games, and I'm wondering if it should maybe at the, be at the top spot. But here it is. Um, <laughs> Isn't it feel like you cheat on game. somebody when you rank something too low? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I still love you. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the Lord of the Rings, the card game. Mm. Um it was a choice between this or the Arkham Horror uh, Living Card game, which you mentioned earlier as well. Um, and I love what they've done with the Arkham Horror Living Card game, the way they've updated it, the system, and, you know, they've it down to who plays one character. <laughs> um, but the Lord of the Rings, just the theme for me, edges out everything. And the way that they've gone into such fine minutiae uh, of detail throughout all of these card sets, the art is peerless, um, the gameplay gets more and more complex as time goes on, and it is difficult to come back to if you've abandoned it for a while because you have to go through the deck construction and find your way back in, and 
the deck that you made last time round won't compete against the newer expansions and stuff, but just the sheer scale of it and just the gigantic love letter to Tolkien that it is, um, it's it, amazing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, my my biggest barrier with that is that you have to play with multiple characters. Yeah. And it becomes a lot. It really, it, it, it becomes a lot, not in terms of like, like it's a lot of math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. It is. And, and at the end, you know, at the end of the game, when you look down, like thirty different characters spread across your your side of the table. It's it's crazy. It's like you built an army, um, but the the journey of getting to that point and everything is just it's 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 brilliant. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so I have another IP game. It's my number four. This is kind of a forgotten game. I don't hear a lot about it. They dripped about a couple of expansions and moved on. Uh, This is the Dresden Files cooperative card game. Yes, my number four low player count game. I love this game as a solo. It is a very fantastic. I don't, again, I think with Lord of the Rings, same thing. I don't think I'd love it as much without the IP. If this was just. You the IP first, yeah. Yeah, it, it, like, it, that matters. I, I'm shallow. <laughs> <laughs> That's allowed. You're allowed to like the things that Abs- you like. Absolutely. And it's like, it, it gives me entry into a very clever, quick puzzle game. I think this wouldn't be as high also without the app. I played hundreds of games of the app. Just like, you know, throw on some random, you know, Harry and two investigators versus some random scenario. And they're all book based. I've read all the books multiple times. Uh, and you know, this is not a thematic experience in the sense of like, I don't feel like I'm playing through the game, but it reminds me of, you know, fun times and reading about the kooky stuff that happens. And it's just, you can just pound out a game in five minutes. And in the physical game, it takes a little bit longer because you're gonna shuffle tokens around. But I mean, in terms of just a, a very, very quick dip into a world that makes me really, really happy. I'm a puzzle guy anyway. I love Sudoku's and Kukuro's and everything. Um, this one just hits me right in my sweet spot. Uh, that is Dresden Files Cooperative Card Game. Are you a big um, kind of like, because it's like the big um, the big IPs, right? The Harry Potters and the Lord of the Rings and all that kind of stuff. Uh, do you ever get to that second level of uh, fantasy IPs and geek IPs that you that you really enjoy? Um, not as often as I'd like. Uh, I think a lot of my sort of geek days as a kid were spent reading Forgotten Realms, D&D ah, books. Ah, yes. And I invested so much in that that it, <laughs> it, it was great at the time, but it, looking back is a kind of insular perspective into the wider world of fantasy reading that's out there. Mm-hmm. So um, I liked Terry Brooks, you know, Shannara and stuff like that. Um, but I've not kept up to date with uh, newer stuff except through TV shows. Even with Game of Thrones, I read the first book. But in reading the book, I was like, I just had all the characters from the TV show in my head, so I was like, I'm just going to watch the TV show yeah. instead. Which is, uh, <laughs> this is a heresy, I know, but um, only so much time in your life. I mean, at least the TV show ended. It may, not have, <laughs> it may not have been the best ending that people wanted. It may have actually been a crappy ending. <laughs> what did you think I was, of that? I was glad that it ended. There was, there's a few shows that sort of build up and then wrap up, you know, and there was that, and The Wire. And I think everything else just went on as far as it could until it got cancelled or everybody left. So uh, right. it, it was just nice to get a conclusion to the story. Whether or not people were happy with it, uh, I don't really care because the biggest complaint about it was that it was all happening too quickly. Yeah, and the whole thing was, it spent seven seasons doing nothing. <laughs> so <laughs> like, that didn't fucking happen. So, from my point of view, I, I loved it. I was, you know, I, was, I was glad to see it wind up and, and not sort of dangle a... Oh, are we going to get another season? You know, and, and have a cliffhanger episode. No, just give me the end. That's it. Move on my life. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we are now to our top threes. Number three for top ten low player count games. Okay, and again, probably a contender for number one spot, but Major Nightmare the board game. Mm. So the top it tops out every sort of solo board game is list, and, and rightfully so. It's absolutely brilliantly designed. Um, it doesn't do as well in multiplayer, and I would never play it with more than two, I don't think, just in terms of the, the time investment. Um, but the card play, the deck building, the map exploration, the maths, because there's, <laughs> there's a lot of maths going into working out how to assault cities. Um, it's just, it, it's peerless in, in what it does. Um, it, I wouldn't call it a thematic game as such, because it doesn't really... For me, it doesn't tell as great a story. It's mostly just attacking stuff and, and stealing treasure. But the way that you go about doing it is completely, or was completely unique until sort of Gloomhaven came along and, and lifted the, the card play um, 
right. elements of it. But um, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic experience, and every single time I'm, I get it out to play it, I'm rewarded with that same um, sort of enthusiasm, enthusiasm that I had for it the first time I played it. You know, in fact, probably more so because the first time I played it, I couldn't get my head around it. <laughs> it took about three games to find out what was going on with it. Um, but now that I do, every time I pick it up and set it up, I'm like, why am I not playing this every day? It's amazing. <laughs> right. All right, so um, just to kind of specify my number three, uh, well, my, my whole list in general, I kind of try to focus on card games, um, where Tristan is bringing the thunder, uh, <laughs> which is perfectly fine. It's all, we're, 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 talking about, we're talking about games over here, so hopefully you guys, you guys are happy. Um, but my number three, uh, Low Player Echo Game, I've been, I have not gotten enough of this. And I actually have you to thank, uh, Tristan, because I put up a thread in the One Player Guild about... What are the solo games that people are looking forward to at Gen Con? And you mentioned this game. And I'm not sure if you played it or you just saw it looked interesting. Um, but Mageling. Oh, yes. No, I sat down with the designer. Um, unwittingly. <laughs> uh, we, we were having um, a beer on, on the strip and just got chatting to this guy and um, enthusing about games. I think a third party introduced us or something and he just pulled out his game and said, oh, here, you know, I'd, I'd love you to give it a try sometime and just pass me <laughs> a copy of what turned out to be Mageling, yeah. Um, wow. And it's one of those, that, again, that ties the theme and the mechanics quite beautifully in a, a neat little game. But, but I'm speaking on your behalf. You, you tell us, Jason, what you like about it. No, it's good. <laughs> we just had an episode very recently where I just went gaga <laughs> for this game. <laughs> Don't have to go over it too much, but it's a kind of an um, a adventure dice game. Uh, card based, some dice, you know, kind of think one deck dungeon, but a little bit less on the, on the dice manipulation, a little bit more on that kind of, um, you know, sense of journey and adventure and the the comboing plays out in a different way, but it's still satisfying. Oh, <laughs> all you had to do was say, okay, a more thematic, uh, slightly like, I, I say thematic, it's such a weird thing because it's not thematic. It's not like I feel like whatever, but it just immerses me more. It, yeah. it 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 gives me a more of a it tickles my imagination a little bit more. I, like when it comes to a game, I don't need a game to like grab me and immerse me. I just need it to point me in the right direction. You know, yeah. just don't fight me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and give me enough to play with where I'll just kind of like do whatever I need to do. And One Deck Dungeon was a festival of math at the end of the day. It's, it's satisfying and fun. Uh, but this one does a little bit more to give me that sense of like I'm progressing through a land and you know, building up my power and the dice are very satisfying and fun and the combos are good and it's very different ways to win every single time. It's upstairs in my on my desk right now. It is my go-to at night when I don't want to play on my phone, just bang something out quick game. I love it. it uh, so that is mage life. Love it. Fantastic. And great art too. Yep. All right. So we are to our number two. Let's go for a number two low player count games. I can't believe so. You've already knocked off Lord of the Rings, Mage Knight, Spirit Island. I mean, what is left? Okay, well, uh, number two spot for me here today is Kingdom Death Monster. I should have known. It's Tristan <laughs> Hall, of course. <laughs> How could that be number one? <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> We've gone past about three that could have been number one so far. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, ultimate sort of. Uh, ridiculous game and a complete sort of pipe dream from the designer Adam Poots. Um, just the world building in it is epic, and it's his pay into Warhammer Quest. And um, there's there's a lot for me. There's a lot. There's a huge barrier to entry. The you have to play a campaign, so you have to have the same team. Or you know, if you play it solo, you're going back to the same town every time you play. Um, miniature assembly is an absolute nightmare for someone like me who doesn't excel at that and doesn't paint at all. Um, but once you get past that and the, the rule book and everything else, there's just nothing else like it. It is an absolute, um, well, it does what it says in the tin, it's a monster of a game. And it's hugely thematic. The artwork is fantastic. Um, and I just I just love the fact that this was probably the first game of its kind where someone, like a, an indie designer just went off and developed the biggest most unwieldy gigantic gaming world imaginable um, and took maybe four years but when he came back and delivered it everyone was like i think <clears throat> excuse me my expectations and a lot of other people's were just like okay whatever you know it's, it's probably not going to be very good but when it actually proved to be fantastically enjoyable it was just it, it blew everyone away 
<laughs> I I love town building. I don't like getting murdered by a random lion every time <laughs> I go out, every time I leave. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> When I say random line, I'm talking about a line that just like rolls good. <laughs> oh god, yeah. I mean, there's so, there is so much. Um, you know, if you, you roll a one and you know your head gets ripped off by a passing worm or whatever, <laughs> there's so much of that. Um, and I think as long as you go in with that expectation, then there's a, a world of fun to be had with it. And and actually, once you get stuck in, the, the tactical depth of the battles and everything is huge. Um, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole subset of gameplay in terms of preparing for the hunt itself, preparing for the showdown itself, building your technologies for your people, for your town and everything. There's so much going on. And if anything, that's probably the biggest reason it doesn't get to the table as often as it should for me is because you're like, oh, well, if I get this out, that's going to stay set up for the next week. You know, yeah. it's, yeah. it's not just something that I'm going to play for a couple of hours and put, put away again. All right, so that was Kingdom Death Monster. Um, so me, <laughs> funny how I like this big game, little game, big little game, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> We're keeping it. <laughs> Next time I'll stick to the rules, Jason. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, my number two game is Onirim. Uh, I love Onirim. I love the shuffle together game where you just put all, you know, three expansions, four expansions, all seven. Why not? <laughs> I completely love this game. I cannot believe the app is not updated in over a year with more expansions. It makes me worry that I'm never going to get them. Boo! Uh, but I, uh, there's plenty of episodes where we've talked about Oni Rim. It's one of the classic games in the solo uh, solo. Game. Always very very high in the top 100 list at the end of the year. So Oni Rim, that is the art style. Time. What's that? What do you think of the art style? I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Divisive, yes. Uh, people are like, oh, what is this? craziness but uh, to me again it, it, it's like i mean the majoring art style um it's not so like even like it's the art is okay it's the color scheme that really kind of tells me i'm in a fairy world i'm in the feywild esque you know like like just playing with color in the right way can do so much and what elise placis is doing and her in onirim kind of does the same thing like i don't need to know exactly what's happening it just point me in the right direction and it pulls me and just i i love it you know and, and it, it just sinks me in and if i didn't have that art would i like the game as much i can honestly say i wouldn't like the game as much i i assuming that you are of a different opinion <laughs> <laughs> oh no i was i was no i was just genuinely interested to hear what you think um, the the art style i think suits what it is you know this sort of dream world uh semi nightmarish kind of thing that you're exploring um but it's and, and I did play it, I played it about 20 times when it first arrived, sort of to, to process it and to get a feel for the mechanics and everything. Um, and then I felt like I'd come to the end of it, even with all the expansion stuff, I didn't feel like one that I really want to play again. Um, but I understand why people are drawn to that. Um, and the fact that it plays in, you know, 20 minutes, you can battle through a game uh, on a break whilst you're waiting for something to start. It's uh, to be valued. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, when, when is that game coming from you? We need that quick game from Call of Nothing. <laughs> you make these big honking games, I can't deal with them. <laughs> so, well, yeah, so we're, we're developing a game, and it's going to be after 1565, um, mm. called Veil Wraith. And in fact, it's what I'm, it's set up on my table, and I've been playing it over the past week solidly, because it's a design I sort of returned to recently. Um, and it's my version of a game that I would like to play that takes 20 or 30 minutes. Cool. Um, but for me, the difference would be it would have to have amazing art. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, but then, you know, art is completely subjective, and what I think is great, other people might not. And we're going for a very different direction in the art at this time. It's going to be um, black and white, sort of um, post, post-apocalyptic, post end-world kind of art. It's very strange, but it plays really quickly, and um, it's a campaign as well, so you can keep going back to it and keep adding a little bit more each time you go. But, yeah, we'll, we'll speak about that after 1565. Yeah, like, you, you could tell that you're a company uh, head of somebody. You're just ready to strike with the next product. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Here's some promo. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so number one, your number one is either some gonzo game that is completely out of left field or Gloomhaven. <laughs> <laughs> Gloomhaven didn't make it into the list, unfortunately. I, wow. I was between that and Spirit Island, um, and I think Spirit Island nudged it out for me in terms of just the accessibility of it. Um, Gloomhaven, I, I love, and again, I'm playing it with my 
with my son, although he's kind of mentally taken a break from it. Right. <laughs> We've played it for a while. Uh, but, no, I mean, you'll never have seen this one coming on, I suppose, but it's uh, Warfighter, the Special Forces card game. Wow. Yes, <laughs> that, like I told you, Gonzo game from left field. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so this is a game um, about, I don't even know when it came out, maybe three or four years ago, I was designing a game, and it was based on these um, war stories that I used to love reading growing up about um, soldiers up against overwhelming odds, which, of course, you know, ties into 1565 and stuff. But I love the idea of taking a squad of like sort of Navy SEALs or SAS troops and dropping them behind enemy lines and them having to uh, achieve an objective and then get out alive. Um, and I just designed this game called um, O Dark 100, or, or started designing this game. And I got quite far along uh, with it. Um, and then Warfighter, the Special Forces card game, came out and I played it and I was like, well, that's the game that I wanted to design. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so uh, you know, I ceased, I ceased work on it. And it, it comes back to what we were talking about before, uh, you know, about if, if only design a game if it's not already out there sort of thing. Um, and it, right. it's filled that need for me. You, you equip a team, you send them behind enemy lines, you, you go off to an objective. Um, and it's one that gripped me so much. I think it's become one of, if not the most... Um, played game on solo game on my table, uh, you know, outside of ones that I've designed myself, um, and every time I pick it back up, I have a, a great time with it, and it's uh, it, it just it captures all those elements of uh, going through and, and having a thrilling sort of action thrill ride. Uh, it j just does it really well. The graphics aren't great. The, um, the in fact, the graphic design is in, in some respects it, it can be a bit of a barrier. But the gameplay is fantastic, and it just it speaks to me on a personal level, and, and just ticks off a lot of boxes um, of, of things that I enjoy, just sort of dice rolling combat games, and uh, and and part of it being equipping your team before you go on a mission. But it's not really like a clunky thing where you're going to build a whole deck of cards. You're literally just handing out guns and grenades and you know maps or whatever <laughs> to to your to your squad of, of special forces, and then sending them in against the mission. It's just it does. It does everything. It does perfectly. Mm. You, you brought it back, Tristan. You gave us. <laughs> you brought it back to card games. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I. I am not a war guy. I gotta admit it. Um, I will play a clever war game like you know your games and some of the others. Uh, but I, Warfighter just never looked like anything. So hearing you talk about it, <laughs> I might have to take a look. All right, uh, so my number one, um, no surprise if you, anybody knows me, Race for the Galaxy. Oh, love Race for the Galaxy. Love it solo, love it multiplayer, love expansions. Uh, there's actually new Race for the Galaxy coming uh, in the Xeno Invasion thing, I think, later in the year. Uh, just uh, love it. <laughs> did a whole episode on it, did a whole, like, you know, kind of improve your play for strategic strategery of it. Oh, man, just Race for the Galaxy. Will not, I, I doubt that it, that will be overtaken in terms of a... Engine building combo it combo licious card game. Love it. Love All right. It. I never played it solo. <laughs> it's 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 the, the the bot is definitely an old bot. You know, like you, you lay yeah. down the first expansion, which was a two that two thousand six seven somewhere on there, uh, somewhere it, it, before the twenty tens, and it feels like an old bot. <laughs> There's right. definitely been evolution in the solo, um, in like solo design since then. Um, so I, I, I wonder what Tom Lehman would do with that now, or maybe he's just kind of moved on to other things. Um, but I still, I mean, just, I love cards. Uh, obviously, with the way I start the list, I just, oh my God. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I'm actually going to rush into that last part because I know we're going very, very long in terms of the uh, gaming portion of the show. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the preview we did for 1565 St. Elmo's Pay. Uh, gone through the top 10 list, uh, got a sense for what Tristan likes uh, his influences in terms of how he crafts his game, you know, the games that uh, kind of are in his mind or in the back of his mind when he's designing stuff. Um, so Tristan, thank you so much for sharing that and and uh, the project hopefully will be launching pretty soon, right? Yeah, that's the plan. Um, we're trying to line up all our ducks and get the advertising and everything ready. Um, but the yeah, the game is, is good to go. The artwork is almost entirely complete. Um, so just really excited to hit go on it and and, uh, and follow up 1066 Days to Many Mothers with a game that's going to hopefully do as well as, as that game did. 
Absolutely. All right, so we are going to conclude the gaming portion of this podcast. Uh, the rest of this podcast is going to be some geek out, historical context stuff. So if you're not interested in that, then go ahead and tune in next week for more games that we've played uh, post Gen Con and post S and all that kind of thing. Uh, all right, so let us get into the historical background of 1565. So uh, my approach to history is I, I, I tend to be, because I'm a, I was a high school teacher, so I tend to kind of think in like the kind of big concepts, right? Big themes and sweeps. and all, Like what's the what was happening when this particular thing was happening? So when I found out that you wanted to kind of, uh, talk about year game, 1565, I'm like, okay, what was happening? <laughs> Why does that? Why that period? Why does that make sense? So, a couple of things are happening. So, I mean, you, we're in Europe, and um, Saint Elmo is on the island of Malta. Yes. Okay. So the Malta is a very very small island. The only reason gamers would know Malta is because Rado lives there now. <laughs> <laughs> when you visited Malta, did you see Rado? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I don't, I don't know if he was there at that time, but um, <laughs> uh, was, and, and in fact, this all of this came to me a, a long time after Malta because um, 1066 came about before that. Um, mm-hmm. But I did pick up on a little bit of the history whilst I was there, and uh, a little bit of the battle, and it struck me that the, the siege of Malta was very much like the Battle of Thermopylae, you know, in, in um, 300, the, the movie or the graphic novel, um, of just this small outpost of soldiers up against an overwhelming armada of, of troops, you know, and, and how they managed to survive and swing that and and basically stop what would have been the Ottoman Empire sweeping through the, you know, the whole of Southern Europe. Right. And, and, yeah, it spoke to me on a fundamental level. It's one of those battles like like all of the, like, well, like the Battle of Hastings, like in 1066, in... 1565, it could have gone either way, and, and the fate of Europe would have been entirely different if it had had a different outcome. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I read a, a couple of history books about it, a couple of um, historical novels about the, the battle, and it just, it was one of those stories that wouldn't go away, you know, it was sort of scratching around in my head for the longer, longest time. Um, and after I designed 1066, the question came up about what other battles to cover and one of I mean had a list that I was going through one of them was going to be Agincourt but it was the French versus the English again I didn't want people to think that had like something <laughs> like, <laughs> about, like, it, it French. Um, another which and, and of course these might be future titles one of them was going to be uh, Sir Francis Drake against the Spanish Armada yep. but then the more I looked into the, the siege of Malta the more I read about it the more I realised that it, it just had the scope and it just felt like um, the thing that I was most passionate about, the story that I was most passionate about um, exploring and once the um, finding out about the three frontiers that it was fought over, the three outposts and everything, everything just started to come together about how easily it would fit the system that we designed, that I designed for 1066 Tears to Many Mothers. Um, so, I mean, when you talk about, like, the fate of Europe is, you know, turned to this one battle, like, <laughs> you know, historians kind of argue about it, but th- it really was kind of a critical turning point time in European history. So, the, the in 1512, Martin Luther nails the Protestant um, 95 Theses on, a, 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 I think it's like a church in Wittenberg or something like that. And so, kicking off the Protestant Reformation. So, Christendom, Christendom, the big Christian empire in Europe that has reigned for a thousand years, is, like the bells are tolling and people are wondering it's like okay what is happening to europe at this time because you have these this discontent with the catholic church which is seen as corrupt and just you know uh, not a good actor you know the the the, the previous century you had this you know multiple popes <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know kidnap popes kidnapping each other so like what is like people are kind of wondering what's happening with christendom and at this very time there is a new empire the ottoman empire it has just, you know, started. I mean, it, we talk about like kind of the Arabs and, you know, uh, that whole area of the world, but the the Ottoman Empire was different and it was new and it was young and vigorous. And it had, um, if you've played any Civ game, any Civ game whatsoever that represents the Ottomans, you're going to get Suleiman the Great. <laughs> <laughs> you know who that is. He's probably barked at you during your Civ game to trade him oh. more wheat and more wheat. <laughs> 
But I, it, it, at this very moment, that leader in the world, and he really was one of the great kind of you know, it facilitated expansion. At one point, the Ottoman Empire controlled uh, territory worth 25 million people, which is a huge swath of land for one empire to cover, uh, had conquered the Byzantines, which is the Greek empire, uh, and their ascendant. And there was real worry in Europe that the Ottomans would just kind of keep coming. And they didn't make any secret about that. They said, you know, they're kind of putting out there like, okay, you guys are next. <laughs> you know, so they're coming. And so what, what is, what's happening? So, so Christendom is kind of like being assaulted. And also, you know, along with the idea of Christendom is the kind of like old school kind of crusades, um, you know, orders and knights and that, that, that stuff is still there. So when we're talking the Siege of Malta, we're talking the Knights of St. John, which is a Crusader era order. And they had just, they'd gotten beat by the Ottomans. So they were at this, uh, the island of Rhodes, which is near Greece, which is a, actually a nicer, <laughs> bigger uh, place for them to be. They got beat by the Ottomans and they, and they went to Malta just because they had no choice. Like Malta was a rock at that point. Nobody did want to be there. So they're like, all right, well, <laughs> we, this is the best we can do. Uh, so they hunkered down and they did what knights do, which is, you know, kind of make the best of the situation. And then, you know, the Ottomans are looking for ways to kind of expand and they already kicked their butts once. So it's like, all right, well, we're going to have to finish the job over here. And a bunch of other historical things happen. I'm kind of obviously making things simple. So just to kind of set the scene for what Tristan is talking about, where this was a really dramatic moment. So this was like, uh, you know, they'd already gotten their butts kicked and they were outnumbered crazy amount what um have the numbers here so like you had 6100 knights give or take on the you know defending the the entire land of malta you know and should talk about these three forts right so then they're up against an uh an estimated army of forty thousand, and 6100 versus forty thousand doesn't usually go very well <laughs> <laughs> that is not a like a battle so it, it just ups the stakes on what Tristan is talking about in terms of like why this is important. So like, okay, so the Ottomans are, you know, they're branching out and they've decided that, okay, this is going to be our entry. Once we get a foothold on Malta, it's right below Italy. We can launch into Italy from there. And that was the big the fear, right? And Italy, what's in Italy? The seed of Christendom. <laughs> so if the Ottomans are at the doorstep right there, they could just launch in and, you know, basically rip out the, you know, the decaying heart of Christendom and who knows what's going to happen from there. So that's kind of the theory. That's what's, that's what's going on. So obviously you're going to get some argument about that. Historians love to argue about everything. But it, this is a big deal. So that's the backdrop behind what's happening. And yeah. then we get to the actual battle. So then let's kind of break down a little bit. I don't want to go into too much detail, but like a little bit of what exactly is happening on those like days before you know before and during that the the actual siege yeah okay so i mean you you've got a brilliant overview of of the lead up to the battle there and of course Suleiman the magnificent was in a line of sultans whose um whose expansion plans were as unstoppable as, as the empire itself that their whole they would basically each sultan would build their palace from the the palace would be built from the funds, from the plunder that they yeah. that they got during their reign. Um, the the battle with the knights because they he'd beaten them at Rhodes and driven them off to Malta. It was like for him it was a point of uh, pride that he had to wipe them out off the face of the earth, and that's why he'd sent such a massive armada. It was to teach them a lesson and and to finish them off for good. Because in the intervening period. The Knights of St. John, based on Malta, were effectively pirates. They were just raiding and pillaging every single uh, passing ship from the Turkish Empire uh, and seizing them. And, uh, and there was slavery on both sides. The, the actual fuel for these ships uh, going around the Mediterranean was humans. And it was humans that they'd taken uh, either that the, the Turks had raided from Europe or that the um, Maltese and, and the Europeans had raided from Africa or, or the Turks themselves, and and so the principal players or you know the, the leaders on both sides, um, Jean de La Valletta, who who was the leader of the Maltese forces, had been a, a galley slave, you know, and um, Dragut who or Turgut Rice, who was the uh, he was like the, the leader of the Turkish Armada, he had also been a galley slave, and they'd been exposed to these conditions, these awful conditions of you know rowing for twenty hours solid. 
And so the final straw came about when an agent of the Knights of St. John, Mathurin Romagas, had raided a ship too far and he took the Sultana, which was like this huge uh, statesman's warship that had um, the governor of, I think it was either Cairo or Algiers, and it had the, the babysitter of the Sultan's daughter on board. And uh, he just basically captured these key sort of characters. And so Suleiman said, enough is enough. We're going to wipe that island out, you know, off the, off the face of the earth. Uh, and the siege began. And so when the Maltese Armada turned up, the, uh, sorry, the, when the Turkish Armada turned up, the Maltese had already been pre preparing the defences for like the whole year. And it was over these three forts. You mentioned St. Elmo's, the other two were St. Michael and St. Angelo. And they, they sort of, on three promontories in the Bay of Malta. Mm -hmm. um, and when this gigantic sort of 120 galley, 40,000 strong, or 30,000 strong, depending on which historian you read. Yeah, <laughs> but a lot of different numbers there. <laughs> when this giant army started unrolling, it was, it was just unlike anything they'd ever seen. And so to, to get, to effectively get the ships into the harbour at Malta, the fort of St. Elmo was on a, a, a mountain called Mount Sybaris, which overlooked the bay, and it had cannons up there which could freely fire onto the incoming Ottoman ships. And so that's, um, um, that's really important. Like in 1066, they had they didn't have cannon fire. <laughs> correct, yeah. You know? And so that was the big kind of technological innovation that, like, you don't have guns yet, I don't think. I don't, they're not proliferating or, like, you know, muskets and stuff. Like, they, if you fight a war in 1500s, you're fighting with cannon fire. And they were nothing but cannonballs <laughs> <laughs> flying all over the place. That's and right. So, yeah. and and it's almost like the, the, the true part is, I mean, it's not incidental, but, you know, you, it really is a bunch of people trying to position themselves to, you know, optimize cannon fire. And then when it came down to it, there was like, you know, big melees and they were still fighting like, you know, swords and the melee weapons of the day. But, you know, that's really important to kind of note because when you go the Malta, and I've never been, but I've, I've seen like pictures, I'm really interested in this stuff. That's what you're going to see. <laughs> yeah. There's whole, like balls and holes and all, all that stuff. <laughs> and and the, I mean, the Ottomans had taken with them um, like an inconceivable amount of ammunition. It was, a, it was something like 100,000 cannonballs and 2,000 tons of gunpowder. And, you know, they, they were ready for a, a prolonged siege and probably they were ready to take Malta and then jump off from there and, and head into Europe. You know, there was, in, in their minds, there was no um, concept of, of being stopped or held up for any length of time by these, these three little forts with, um, it was 500 knights, I think, was the actual number of knights, and, and the rest, the other sort of five or 6,000 defensive forces were mostly the, the people of Malta. There was a few hundred sort of enlisted soldiers, but it was the men, women, and children of Malta defending their own um, island basically mm -hmm. um so yeah so when 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 they rolled in their first port of call was to to gather around st elmo's and just pound it with cannon fire um until one well, the reason being or the reasoning being if they took st elmo's they had they could see over the bay they had command over the bay the ships could come in and they could pound the other two lower promontories st michael's and st angelo at their leisure um, but the problem was, because St. Elmo's was at the top of this mountain, getting to it was hugely difficult, and they hadn't realised on the defences that the knights had prepared, and they had, um, like I said, they had a year to, to gather ammunition, supplies, water, uh, food, and medicines, and everything else. Yeah, and that's, a, that's kind of a historical quirk, where you, you see these like big turning point battles, and it was a quirk that the, the, knights, the knights were kicked out of Rhodes, and then the, Mal the Maltese attack didn't happen until 10 years later. So I was like, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Just go. <laughs> you know they're there. Yeah. Go. <laughs> well, I, it was, yeah, it was, I mean, there was, a, there was a huge gap in between because the, um, when Rhodes is just off the coast, you know, or was just off the coast of the, of the Ottoman Empire. So when they were raiding there, it was literally, it was, they were the thorn in the side of um, Suleiman and, and the Ottomans. But the, the siege of Rhodes took place in 1515. So it was actually 50 years earlier. And when, oh God, yeah. when, Suleiman, when Suleiman turned up to that island, he was like, I think he was about 25 years old. So he was out to prove himself. Um, and actually, when he defeated the knights there, it ended honorably. The knights at Rhodes ran out of ammunition. And so they, they <laughs> had to give up. So he, 
he basically shook their hands and said, you know, you fought really well. And it was very, it was very similar to the Siege of Malta in many respects, in terms of the overwhelming odds and that. Um, but the Ottomans cleared them out. He shook hands with the commander and sent them on the way, and, you know, put them in a boat and said, you fought bravely, you know, off you go kind of thing. Um, so when they relocated to Malta, it was out of his mind for the longest time. But over that, over those intervening decades, the, uh, the, Malta, the Knights of St. John proved to be these irrepressible pirates, basically, in his mind, who were just raiding his ships constantly. And, and so when it, came to, when it came back around to Malta all these years later, it was a much more personal vendetta because, you know, um, the, he no longer considered them to be fighting with honour. And the, his leader that he sent in, Mustafa Pasha, was known for, you know, his, his cruelty and his unstoppable sort of nature. So it was a very different, there was a, a, a different level of bitterness. And, and that was proven... Um, at St. Elmo. So, over weeks and weeks, the Turks were pounding the walls of St. Elmo's with these cannonballs um, and flattening it. And then every time they sent the Janissaries in to charge in, the knights popped up from nowhere. And, and in their minds, they must have leveled the fort and killed everyone in it. But these knights just kept popping back up and repelling them and, and pushing them back. And one of the main reasons for this is that at night, the, the other two um, forts were sending supplies over secretly in the middle of the night. They were they were ferrying out new soldiers and bringing back the injured, so that they were treating the injured and then sending them back over and and reinforcing them without the without the Ottomans realizing. So mm-hmm. every time they thought they they were destroying these beleaguered knights, they were suddenly faced with fresh troops and Greek fire and cannonballs and everything else, and they were like, yeah. Was, it's like home field advantage, right? So, like, you look at the modern time, you know, the U.S. is in the war with Afghanistan. We've been in there for, like, 17 years. Why? Yeah. <laughs> we should sweep them away, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but what's happening is you have your the U.S. forces are fighting and then fighting the Taliban. The Taliban can just disappear in the mountains of Pakistan yeah. and reprovision and train and heal and come back and they're a fresh fighting force. Obviously, that's over a longer period of time. But yeah. when you have home field advantage, you can do stuff like that so you can face those overwhelming odds. Absolutely, yeah, and, and and they were taking full advantage of that, you know, and and it was it was a long time before the Ottomans were in a position to, to to deal with that and send ships into the bay to, to try and prevent it from happening. Um, but take, the, taking the fort of St. Elmo's was key to that, and in and actually, once they had finally pounded it down to the ground and it was on fire and there was no defences left, and the knights in the fort were sending messages saying we need more help, and Jean de la Valletta, the, the Grandmaster of the Knights of St. John said, enough is enough now, you know, we, we literally can't send anyone, anyone else over because the remaining knights, such as they are, are going to have to defend these other two forts. So his yeah. whole goal was just for St. Elmo's to just last as long as it could and for the, the soldiers there to sell their lives as dearly as possible, you know, and, and they were basically committed to die. And so the defenders had to come to terms with that. Um, and then once, of course, eventually it was overrun, the um, the passion and the bloodthirst was running so highly that the the inhabitants of St. Elmo's when the Janissaries overtook it were just butchered um, to the man almost. I think a, a handful of survivors got away. Um, but the knights in particular were targeted by uh, Mustafa Pasha's troops because he wanted to teach the, the, the Order of St. John a lesson. And so all of these uh, the knights, who were easy to spot because they had these big red surcoats on with a white cloth. Yeah, which, they don't make it. <laughs> they don't make a secret of it. Yeah, and they, and they were like targets, you know, for snipers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they, they were they were easy to identify, and so they found these guys that tortured them, and did, you know, horrible things to the bodies, decapitated them, crucified the bodies, and, and sent them um, across the water. These mutilated corpses, and it was to send a clear message that if you carry on resisting, this is what's going to happen to you. But, of course, when these bodies washed up at the other two forts, these were their brothers, fathers, and yeah. sons and friends of, of the knights at the other two outposts, and instead of sort of capitulating, they doubled down and said, well, if that one fort has resisted, you know, with just a couple of hundred guys, um, and they've killed thousands of Ottomans at this point, you know, over the, over the course of the siege, then if they can do that, then we can resist. And so, as the Ottomans finished taking St. Elmo's, they really gathered the forces and they brought them back down the mountain to fight the final two promontories at Burgu and Senglia. 
Oh, you you uh you missed the the most interesting part. How um Jean de Villette, like decapitated his prisoners of war and oh, put sorry, their heads in oh. put their heads in cannons and fired <laughs> them back the Ottomans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we're laughing at it, but yeah, the, I mean, the brutality, and like the slavery, it was an ugly, ugly battle. Oh, yeah. It was bright on both sides, and he took, yeah, so as, as soon as the bodies washed up on the shore, um, he took all the all the Turkish prisoners out and, and beheaded them, and uh, as you say, just fired fat, fat, <laughs> cannonballs of, of heads over, and, and though, you know, all of these events are represented in the game, there each is a card, you know, a pitiless butchery card, or a human head bombardment card. Really? Uh, have a yeah, human no, head bombardment card? Yeah. yeah <laughs> that's, a, that's a one-shot, I assume. It is. It's a one-shot event, and it's a, it's a biological weapon. You know, <laughs> one of the I first believe that. <laughs> Because, I mean, that was that was a tactic during, the, during those times, was to try and infect the enemy as well by firing diseased bodies over in catapults and everything. It was the ugly, you know, horrific um, conflict. Um, so, yeah, so as you say, that blood was running high on both sides and when when the Ottomans came down to fight to continue the, the siege to the other two outposts they attacked at Senglia and were given misinformation by a Greek corsair called Pandalissa who told them that there was a, a breach in the walls and to charge this breach but there was no breach so we, you have thousands of Ottomans charging against a completely impassable wall and then being burnt um, with Greek fire, you know, shot with muskets and and routed effectively and chased back into the into the French Greek into the sea, and as they were chased into the sea, uh, the Maltese who had routed them were slitting the throats and stabbing the backs and chanting Saint Elmo's Pay, and it's an expression that the Maltese used to today. It means no mercy, and of course it was you know it was their revenge for what had happened at the fort, and that and that's where we get the title of the game, yeah. Saint Elmo's Pay, um, and and that's. You know that's not even that's not even half of the tale. It, it goes on then the, the battle. Yeah, we could go on. <laughs> it's not a history podcast. <laughs> we we are amateurs over here, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it continued for weeks after that, and there were so many moments where the battle could have gone either way. Um, you know, Mustafa Pasha organized an attack of twelve thousand of his men to uh, attack both forts at the same time, um, and. As he did so, he basically emptied the the Ottoman base camp of all of the men, fighting men that he could to attack these frontiers, not knowing that there was a, a tiny cavalry force of a hundred uh, Maltese soldiers who was patrolling the 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 outback, basically the you know the badlands and everything, and picking off uh, Turkish stragglers where they could. And these cavalry saw their opportunity to charge into the Ottoman base camp and set fire to it and destroy all the supplies, kill all the wounded, take out all the sentries, burn all the food. And so as these, this giant 12,000 strong army was attacking the forts, they saw behind them this huge smoke cloud and they thought that reinforcements had landed from Europe, which was, this was a constant threat throughout the siege, was that Europe, all the European kings and queens were going to get, get their acts together and send over reinforcements to the Maltese. And so that this was like a, a timer, a countdown for the uh, for Mustafa Pasha to achieve his objectives. So when this huge plume of smoke rose out of their, their base camp, they thought that was it, they've arrived. So they charged back and were routed. But in effect, they were routed, 12,000 men were routed by the actions of this tiny handful of cavalry, <laughs> who then just, you know, sat and just disappeared back into the undergrowth again. Um, yep. and, and those moments happened throughout the battle. And so I've tried to sort of crowbar all of them that I can into the game in some way. And um, yeah, it's, it's been fantastic sort of trying to do uh, do it justice, you know, and, and, and cover all the different elements and all the different characters that are, were present at the battle. It, it just makes the game much more rich when you just know that underpinning, you know? It's like you play yeah. a Lord of the Rings game, it's more satisfying when you know who Tom Bombadil is and you know who all these, <laughs> you know, the, 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 yeah, like to know the underpinnings of it. And when it comes to one of these little war games, like, you know, you, you see a card that says, you know, barrage of heads. It doesn't make much sense, but then you know the context of it, you know the the human drama behind it, you know, the, this person had just seen their, like you said before, their sons, their fathers, crucified and floating in the river, or floating in the bay, and, you know, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> yeah. And it's it, it just makes games like this so much more alive, and, uh, you know, I, I love the chance to kind of talk with you about this stuff and how much you've kind of steeped in this stuff. Obviously, the history stuff is pretty uh, fun to me, so, I mean, man, I, I really can't wait to get this game to the table. It sounds like a lot of fun. 
Thanks. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, to get it out there, and and it's been it's been so much fun. You know, just burying my head in books and. and and that being a part of my job, <laughs> you know, to just keep <laughs> I'm doing out. research, honey. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it is. I mean, you you find out about these moments, and they make the hairs on your arms stand on end, you know. And you're like, that's oh, well, that's going to be. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a way I can use it mechanically in the game, or that's the title for the game. And I, yeah, I buzz off this in, in, in the same way that I do off fantasy or science fiction. It's it's a it's a it's a fantastic part of our history. And, um, so even shed the tiniest light on it through um, a card game, you know, it's it's an honour. Me, it's, it's brilliant. It's you know, and, and talking to people at conventions about it and stuff and seeing their eyes light up because they've got a passing interest in uh, the Saxons or the Normans or you know, or Malta or, or any of these conflicts. Um, yeah. And then, I mean, this is huge in Maltese history, you know? I mean, yeah. like, uh, eventually the reinforcements came, and <laughs> eventually. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> uh, and, and Turkey was bad. I was beaten back, and I don't, and that it was almost like the turning point for them more than yes. it was a turning point for Europe because this is it. Like, this was their first major defeat, and it kind of broke the spell of the perceived, like, when, when, when a team has momentum. When, when they, it's like they seem unstoppable, what's going to happen next? But when they get like, suffer a, a grievous defeat like that, you yeah. know, where they marshal so many forces and they can't even beat this little rock, basically. Yeah. And it's like, all right, you know, the, we're now we're in a different spot, and history kind of goes on from there. And Absolutely. you know, uh, what's the capital city of Malta called now? Paletta, of course. And I didn't know that walking around. I didn't realize it was named after the grandmaster who defended it. It was, uh, you know. That they absolutely all of the Maltese people owed their lives to the knights and the knights to the Maltese people because they fought down to the last man, woman, and child, you know. And there, there are reports of the women and children on the battlements throwing rocks down, you know, and, and pouring boil, boiling oil on the enemy. And at one point, um, there were the, the Ottomans were so frustrated in not being able to take these final two forts that they sent a detachment of 4,000 troops to the capital city as it then was, which was the capital city, Medina. They sent 4,000 troops up to the capital to try and take that so they could at least report back and say, we've got something. Um, But when these 4,000 troops turned up at Medina, they saw troops lined up all along the battlements in um, battle dress, and they unloaded cannons at them before they were even in range, and they thought, wow, you know, they're that heavily defended, and if they've got that much ammunition... That there's no point even trying to take them. We'll just go back. So they they went back and, and retreated and carried on the siege. And what had actually happened was the the knights at Medina had lined the battlements with women and children and put them in soldiers' outfits. <laughs> when they fired their opening salvo, which wasn't even in range, they emptied all of their. That's it. <laughs> that was it. That was it. They had no. <laughs> but it was just that one, you know, one chance opportunity that they might convince them that you know look how powerful we are and if they'd have carried on going of course they would have taken the city but there were, there were moments like that throughout the entire um siege and it's it's a real it, it reads the history reads like a thriller you know like this rip roaring sort of adventure that goes back and forth and every time that the um the Maltese are about to go under um they, they win something back impossibly against the odds and it's uh and, and, and likewise, you know, with the with the Turks doing the same, it's just it goes backwards and forwards all the way through, and um, and and results eventually in them holding out just for long enough to, as you say, um, Don Garcia's relief force to arrive from Europe, and it ignites. At that point, you were talking about the momentum of you know a, a team. It ignites the whole of Europe because they're like this unstoppable Ottoman Empire can be defeated, and so sure enough, they get their asses into gear and put together an armada led by Don Juan. Um, and they take this armada to the Mediterranean, and this would be another game in itself, it could be, is the Battle of Lepanto, when this mm-hmm. gigantic armadas on either side, the forces that had never been seen like in this sort of scale before, went to war in the Mediterranean, and, and you know the Ottomans were beaten back then as well, which was kind of the sort of decisive final blow that kept them out of Europe. But yeah, it's all of the sort of outlying events that lead to this like gigantic conclusion to an ongoing uh, conflict. But it all hinges on what would have happened at Malta, and, and uh, it's such a fantastic tale. 
All right, so we are going to tell more fantastic historical tales, or Tristan is. I'm not going to do these things. <laughs> All right, our next time you uh, design one of these games and we have another historical geek out, I'm more than welcome. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> this has been too much fun. <laughs> I'm ho- uh, you know, I-, I don't. Ma- I imagine you don't get a chance to do this a lot on other podcasts. <laughs> Not at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> Tristan, this has been two hours on a Sunday morning slash afternoon. It has flown by, uh, but I feel that I feel the call. <laughs> My wife is like, "What are you doing down there? Get up here!" <laughs> Thanks, my well, friend. Thank you so much of your time, Jason. I really appreciate it. Good luck with everything. Good luck with the project and everything moving forward. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks again.